Thank you for joining us for this COVID update. Mayor Michael Hancock will get this started. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us for this COVID update. And let me wish everyone a happy new year. Uh, before we get started, I want again to say to everyone affected by the Marshall Fire that you remain in all of our thoughts and prayers. We know that the destruction caused by this fire is just uh, unimaginable. And uh, we know that the road recovery is going to be a long, hard road for so many people. Uh, I also want to thank all the first responders from Denver and across the region who deployed to support Boulder County last week. Uh, we will stand ready to continue our support of our neighbors in Boulder County, Superior, Louisville, Lafayette, and whatever we can do as the recovery process moves forward. Now, we want to talk about COVID, of course. As we start this year, COVID is definitely, clearly still with us. For today's update, I am joined by Bob McDonald, the Executive Director of Denver Public Health and Environment, Dr. Connie Price uh, from Denver Health, Dr. David Brumbaugh from Colorado Children's Hospital, Kathy Howe from UC Health, and our Regional Public Health Directors, Dr. Don Comstock, Dr. John Douglas, Camille Rodriguez, and Jason Valling. As many of you know, I shared over the weekend that I had tested positive for COVID. I am grateful that uh, I was fully vaccinated and had been boosted uh, with uh, the vaccine. And uh, as a result, and I truly believe this, my symptoms were mild, uh, code-like symptoms, and uh, they weren't too devastating. I'm grateful that uh, I was not uh, hospitalized at any time. And again, I count that to the fact that I was fully vaccinated. Uh, right now in Denver, our seven-day average case rate is 1,000 per 100,000 population. That's the highest it's been throughout the entire pandemic. Our positivity rate is nearly 25%. That means one in four people being tested are testing positive. And our hospital, hospitalizations, which have been declining steadily over the past several weeks, are climbing again. Hospital capacity is razor thin. And uh, as we will hear from folks in just a moment, it is uh, becoming a critical issue. Most of those who are being hospitalized are unvaccinated. From what we've seen to date, especially with the Omicron variant, being vaccinated and boosted is keeping people who do become infected out of the hospital. That hospitalization rate is the data point that we point to to make critical decisions with regards to our public health orders. It's why we made a decision last week, along with our regional partners, to extend the MAX or VAX public health order through February the 3rd. Thankfully, we got some good news yesterday from the FDA. They've approved boosters for 12 to 15 year olds, and they reduced the time between the initial vaccine doses and boosters to five months for everyone who's eligible and got uh, vaccinated. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough, and I know we sound like a broken record, but this is so critically important and so simple. Get boosted as soon as you are you qualify to be boosted. Uh, it enforces or reinforces your protection from getting the virus, and it will keep you out of the hospital if you do end up getting COVID like I did. And that's the relief our hospitals and our first our frontline workers need right now to maintain capacity. This is an especially urgent need considering the recent uh, fire in Boulder County has taken one of our regional hospitals offline. Doctors, nurses, and hospital staff have been doing their jobs on the brink now for two years. They need a break. And through a simple act of getting vaccinated or getting our booster shot, we can help them get that break. And so again, it's simple. We ask you to get vaccinated and we ask you to get boosted. This is not politics, it's public health. Uh, getting vaccinated, get boosted. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob McDonald who will give us a more thorough review of our current status. Bob? Yeah, Mayor, and with that, we can start the slide deck here. And I'm gonna start where I normally do. Uh, many of you have seen this. Um, it's the epidemiological curve uh, the, uh, that, that depicts the number of cases that we've had since the start of the pandemic. 
um, back in uh, early 2020. And you can see that spike that we went through in November of 2020, uh, where we were stretched to capacity. And you can see where we are today with uh, the most infectious variant that we've seen, uh, cases far exceeding the surge that we saw last year. Now, the obvious question uh, that I suspect we'll hear today is how many of those cases are really that severe? Um, there are a number of breakthrough cases, and as the mayor spoke to earlier, pe people will, will become breakthrough cases. That's not uncommon uh, with other vaccinations as well. Um, but, but here's the key. People who are vaccinated and become breakthrough cases are much, much less likely to wind up in the hospital. Getting vaccinated turns what could be a deadly virus into either something that is asymptomatic or a mild cold. 78% of people who are in Colorado hospitals right now struggling for their lives, many on ventilators, are people who have not gotten vaccinated yet. In my 20 year, over 20 years in public health, I will tell you I've never seen an emerging pathogen or any pathogen that is as random as, as COVID-19 is. Random in terms of it, it taking the life of an otherwise healthy adult in the prime of their life, it taking the life of a child who is otherwise healthy. There are some certainly patterns with people who wind up in the hospital, vaccinated or not, uh, much more likely to wind up in the hospital if they are unvaccinated. And if they're breakthrough case, again, more likely to wind up in the hospital if they have comorbidities or, or existing uh, health problems. But this virus has and will continue to take the lives of unvaccinated people, primarily unvaccinated people. Next slide, please. Uh, this You'll see this pattern, very, very similar to the case rates that on the slide that we just saw. We, we saw that surge in hospital uh, cases back in December of 2020. Um, and then we saw the Delta surge, that's around uh, the start of April there, April and May. Uh, then the Delta surge declined and now uh, we are seeing the Omicron variant uh, surge. And this is far, again, far more infectious. So it's just pure mathematics. We're going to see more people infected. Many of them will be mild cases, uh, asymptomatic cases, even more likely if they're vaccinated. But this virus, with as infectious as it is, and as fast as it's spreading through the community, it's just pure math that it is going to find people who are unvaccinated and those that are unvaccinated are much more likely to wind up in a hospital. We have close to a thousand people right now, close to a thousand unvaccinated people throughout Colorado. They're in, in hospitals right now, many on ventilators who thought that they didn't need to get vaccinated. They thought that their immune system was fine. They, they think they're in great shape and maybe they are, uh, but that wasn't enough to keep them from going into hospitals now, taking up beds, asking for help, uh, being placed on ventilators, and making it difficult for other people to receive uh, care that they need for the many other things that people go to hospitals for. So please, this is a, this is a statewide issue. Um, less than 50% of the people in Denver hospitals right now are Denver residents. So hospitals are taking patients from around the state we need everybody throughout the state to get vaccinated and to wear face coverings if you can. Next slide, please. We have an existing order in place right now. Just as a reminder, um, everyone two ages two and older needs to wear face covering in, in all indoor public spaces. Face coverings are not required in outdoor settings. Um, if you're convening in an outdoor setting with large groups of people, um, it's not a bad idea to wear a face covering, but that's not a part of the mandate. Um, regulated venues can either look for or require face coverings for everybody that comes through the door, or they can look for proof of vaccination. I would, I would ask for everyone in the city of Denver, please do not give regulated businesses a hard time. This is a mandate. It's something that they're required to follow through on, they're required to check for these things. Um, and if they can verify that 95% of the people that are passed through the door are vaccinated, uh, then they can take their face coverings off. The five people, 5% 5 that are unvaccinated still have to wear face coverings. Um, there's an easy way to apply to the Department of Public Health and Environment. 
uh, just uh, email us and let us know that you are moving towards becoming a vaccinated uh, passport facility, and we'll have that on record should we get any complaints and need to follow up. Next slide, please. Um, so just as a reminder, um, that guidelines have changed over the pandemic. It doesn't mean that um, that we're not science-based. It doesn't mean that the science didn't make sense. It just doesn't mean that uh, what we were doing in the beginning didn't make sense. It means that we're following science and the more we learn, the more we need to adjust and do the right thing here. So just as a reminder, if you test positive, um, vaccinated or not, stay home for five days and if symptoms start to resolve and you're without a fever, you can return to work, but wear a face covering for the next five days. If you are exposed, um, but you've been boosted, um, we would ask that you wear a face covering for uh, 10 days, um, test on day five to see if uh, you are positive. And then of course, if you do develop symptoms during that time, you need to stay home uh, until symptoms resolved. And then on the far right there, another scenario is if you are exposed and not vaccinated or not boosted, you're not infectious yet, you're not even, you don't even know if you're positive yet, but if you have been exposed, stay home for five days, test on day five. Um, if you're negative, you can return to work, mask for another five days. And in any scenario, at any point in time you develop symptoms, please stay home and uh, test and follow the protocols. Next slide, please. And then finally, you know, we, we just can't say this enough. We, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We wouldn't be having this conversation about hospitals, many of which in Denver are at capacity, they've tapped out. They, they don't have any beds available left. We wouldn't be having that conversation if everybody would get vaccinated because the unvaccinated people are primarily the ones, almost 80% now are unvaccinated, going to the hospital for help. Um, so you can help out by getting vaccinated, keep up with your boosters, comply with public health orders, um, follow regional orders. We're all in alignment. I appreciate my public health partners throughout the region with us today. And with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Connie Price, the Chief Medical Officer for Denver Health and Hospital Authority. Thank you so much, Bob. Omicron is a highly contagious variant of COVID-19 and now accounts for most infections in our city. This news comes at a time when our hospitals are already overloaded, exacerbated by a depleted healthcare workforce. Our Dr. Price, can you turn on your camera for us, please? Uh, it should be on. I do see it, Teresa. Thank you. Is this better? Can you see me? Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, this pandemic will not end with the virus disappearing. Instead, we need enough people to gain immune protection from vaccination to prevent COVID-19 related hospitalizations and death, even as the virus continues to circulate. Vaccinated and particularly boosted individuals have excellent protection against symptomatic infection and serious illness. Please do your part in helping our community achieve that. Until we do, we can benefit from additional protections of masks to continue our day-to-day -day activities as safely as possible. I'd now like to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Kathy Howell, our Chief Nursing Officer for the University of Colorado Hospital. Thank you, Dr. Price. I definitely want to reemphasize um, what Dr. Price had shared regarding getting boosted and ensuring vaccination and ensuring you're wearing a mask. Our healthcare workers have been taking care of COVID patients for soon to be two years. We know what to do. We know how to care for these patients. Um, our teams across the state have done excellent and our mortality rates are better than many, many states. But what's really concerning us um, is the continual surge. Actually, this last surge, when you show the data, we've been at it for four months. And this Omicron is just icing on the cake. And our staff uh, across the state are tired. They're exhausted. 
Um, you know, if you would ask any of them, it's like, get your vaccine, get boosted, wear a mask. It's simple. It is not difficult. We're all tired too. We're tired of COVID. We wish it would go away, but um, COVID isn't listening to us. So we have to listen there and make it as simple as possible. I also want to emphasize to the public that we're in a significant nursing shortage in this nation, and Colorado in particular is one of the most fixed states. Um, according to a recent report by Mercer that was published in 2021, we're at the bottom five of states in um, um, the nursing shortage. And it predicts by 2026 in Colorado will be short over 10,000 nurses. So you look at this COVID um, surge and the variants out there and the patients that need care that are not COVID patients. And then you think about this nursing shortage that we are living through and will continue to live through. Um, it becomes very challenging from a public health perspective. Um, we have more nurses going into the, the profession than ever, which is great news, um, but it's not keeping pace with population growth and the aging population. So um, my word to all of you is please help us out. Please help yourself out um, for those times you need our care that is not COVID related. Please wear a mask. Please get vaccinated. And um, please Please do, do not make this a political issue. I think Mayor Hancock emphasized this. We are not making this a political issue because it is not, it is science-based. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over um, the podium to Dr. Brumbaugh from Colorado Children's. Thank you, Kathy. I'm gonna focus my comments uh, this morning on why these basic prevention efforts, specifically mask wearing and vaccination are so important to protect our children, both mentally and physically. We cannot forget the health and well being of our youngest Coloradans who are still vulnerable on so many different levels emotionally, physically, and mentally. Here at Children's Colorado, we've seen record, record numbers of patients with respiratory illness, including COVID, but also shocking numbers of behavioral health needs in kids. Those two things have resulted in significant increases in volumes at our hospitals. Masks and vaccines are proven tools in stopping the spread of respiratory viruses, but they also help to keep our schools open. And we know that prevention of outbreaks of COVID in schools are critical for keeping our kids in school and keeping them healthy. The next several weeks will be so important for our kids. They're returning to school this week, at the same time, our community is dealing with a much more transmissible variant, the Omicron variant. We know, and this is one of the lessons learned from the pandemic, is that kids learn best when they're physically present in school. And in-person learning is critical for the mental health and well-being of kids. We know that masking for any child to and over helps cut down on the transmission of COVID, including in the classroom, and masks are safe for kids. I have three children in Denver public schools, elementary school, middle school, and high school. They've been wearing masks at school for the last year and never once has one of my kids complained about wearing masks. But when they've had to stay at home because schools have been closed or they've been uh, quarantined, that's when, that's when the tears start. We also know that vaccinated children have less severe COVID symptoms than those children who are not vaccinated. And so, Mask wearing and vaccination are particularly important when considering the increased transmissibility of the Omicron variant. Omicron has the capability of causing larger school outbreaks amongst children, outbreaks that could potentially lead to school closures. And we can prevent those outbreaks by getting kids vaccinated and by kids wearing masks at school. I know we've seen all of shared in the negative impact of the pandemic on our kids. They've been socially isolated. They've lost time and learning in school and their mental health has suffered. The collective stress, anxiety, the social isolation and grief has been overwhelming and it's taken a real toll on our children. And as parents and as adults in the community, we owe it to our kids to do everything we can to keep them safe and healthy by keeping them in school. As Mayor Hancock mentioned, uh, the FDA uh, this week authorized boosters of the Pfizer vaccine for kids 12 and 15, which adds to our ability to provide protection for our kids. This is a vaccine 
that has been shown to prevent serious effects from COVID illness in children as well. This is one of the most effective vaccinations that uh, has ever been produced and it's safe for kids. So all of my three kids uh, were vaccinated as soon as the, uh, the, the vaccine was eligible for them. And I'm excited that my 15 year old is gonna be able to get boosted soon. I believe in the science and the integrity of the research behind this vaccine. And I got, as I said, I got them vaccinated as soon as I could. For parents who have questions and concerns about vaccination, I encourage you to speak with your child's pediatrician or family doctor. They can address your questions and help you make the right decision for your family. We also have multiple parent resources on our website at children's, childrenscolorado.org. And I'll now pass it back to Mayor Hancock. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brumbaugh, and I appreciate your message. And I hope uh, all of you who are online listening to this tremendous panel of speakers, um, again, we want to thank them for, for being here to, uh, to not only share their thoughts, but to answer your questions. Dr. Connie Price, our Chief Medical Officer from Denver Health, Dr. David Brumbaugh, Chief Medical Officer for Colorado Children's Hospital, phenomenal, and Dr., uh, uh, excuse me, from and Kathy Hale, Howell, excuse me, Chief Nursing Officer, for UC Health. And of course, we always are glad to have our incomparable public health director, uh, Bob McDonald, and the other public health directors from around the region. Let's go ahead and open it up for Q&A right now, and uh, I'll turn it over to the staff to lead us through it. To the panel of speakers, as well as our public health directors, if you have a, a comment that you'd like to uh, make during the session, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. All yeah? right, Mayor. What I'll do is uh, I'll take it, Mayor, and I'll go ahead and just go through the list of reporters for us. We'll start with Meg from the Denver Post. Meg, do you have a question? Yes. Um, you mentioned about hospitals um, being at capacity. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about how that's um, being handled? You know, if um, people are being sent to hospitals outside the Denver area, or if you're having, if the emergency rooms are having to go on. Um, divert more frequently um how how you how are you managing that shall we just go ahead and call on dr connie price start with uh Denver health sure thing um thank you for the question so it is a challenging situation when all the hospitals are uh at capacity really we all still have to take patients and what it what happens is ultimately the care is not as timely as it should be and in some cases, the patients will have to be transferred out of Denver, which takes them away from their families and also prolongs the transport time. So we really need to minimize this. We really need to get the census down and do everything we can to prevent any excess admission. Thank you, Dr. Price. Dr. Brumbaugh. Yeah, I echo Connie's um, sentiments. I, I, I would point out that the hospitals and hospital systems work very closely together on a daily basis if needed to help manage uh, uh, patient transfers across the Denver metro region. Thank you. Kathy Howell, you have any thoughts on this as well from a nursing standpoint? Yes, I again, we do work all together um, um, as far as transferring patients and making sure that there is a bed or a what we call a surge bed somewhere. All of us have um, plans through our incident command process, which most of us are still on for months, where we have um, areas that are not routinely patient rooms, um, but they're more procedural areas that we care for patients while they're waiting for beds to try to give the safest care possible. So many patients end up either waiting in the emergency room for hours or in these temporary beds with staff while they're waiting for a true uh, a true routine bed. So we also have turned away many, many requests for patients outside of the state of Colorado um, because of other states so that we can prioritize um, all of our Colorado patients. Thank you, Kathy. Back to you, Teresa. Thank you. All right, next question, Chris Vanderveen. Chris, do you have a question? I do, thanks, uh, and good to see you uh, uh, feeling better, Mayor Hancock. Um, thanks, my Chris. question is directed towards Dr. Price. Um, it looks as if your hospital uh, in the last week of December had more of your employees 
out sick, and test positive with COVID than in any previous week during this pandemic. Not a surprise considering what's going on. How concerned are you um, in terms of staffing for hospitals in the next couple of weeks in the Denver area, not just for Denver Health, but for all hospitals? Are you going to have the staff to manage this? Well, I'm very concerned because we're just seeing the uptick of these new cases due to the Omicron variant uh, only recently, and we do not appear to be plateauing yet. So I think we are in for a very tough uh, two to three weeks. Um, and we, like uh, Dr. Brumbaugh said, we're coordinating very closely with the area hospitals. This is not a time that we're competing with each other. We are working together to make sure that we can take care of our community. It is a challenge to do so with a depleted staff. I agree with Connie's okay. points. If I could say that I think it collectively across the country, this is the uh, one of the two biggest concerns in terms of providing safe delivery of care is maintaining the integrity of our healthcare workforce and Omicron is a real threat to that. So we're monitoring, monitoring that on a on a day by day basis and we're reinforcing, of course, all of our efforts amongst our team members to keep them safe, uh, mask wearing at every at every component of their uh, their time on our hospital campuses to to keep uh, outbreaks from happening amongst our own team members. Thank you, Dr. Brumbaugh. Teresa? I might, I might share okay. one additional comment. Um, and again, I just got done looking at all of our data over the next six weeks. This is probably going to be the scariest point of this pandemic over the next month. Again, uh, we've all seen the increase of um, positivity among um, our employees. And then coupled by the steep climb again in inpatient admissions, it will definitely be a challenge. And I believe it'll last through this month of, of January. We all have contingency plans on how we stretch, um, you know, alternative care models, et cetera, um, to get us through this. But I'm probably most worried that I've been um, over the next month. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. All right, Mayor, let's go to Esteban. Hi, uh, hi, Mayor, thanks for joining us. Hope you feel better soon. Um, can someone talk about how this surge is impacting testing? Um, anecdotally, we're seeing longer lines at some of the state testing sites. We're hearing rapid tests are hard to find on store shelves. Does the city have any plans to hand out rapid tests directly to residents? Let's start with Bob McDonald, and we'll welcome uh, any of the other uh, speakers. Yeah, thanks for the question, Esteban. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, uh, testing is uh, obviously increasing and for good reason. And we are hearing that it is a little bit more difficult uh, to get tests uh, versus uh, previous efforts just because the volume of tests that are happening. But I will tell you this, that, that every time um, I, I have staff every two or three days, a group, a team of people, uh, that will reach out to testing sites, um, state testing sites, and then in the private sector, Walgreens, CBS, uh, you know, pharmacies and supermarkets, just to see, can they still get a test? And we're finding that the testing is still available. Now, if you want to test the same day during a lunch break or something like that, that might be tough to get. Uh, so it does take a little bit of time uh, looking into a place that you can go to. But in every situation, we've found that we, we can usually get a, a, our, our staff who are kind of doing that secret shopper effort can can find a place to get tested uh, within uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, that being said, we know that the Biden administration is working on pushing out more rapid tests to citizens, and we work very closely with the state health department and regional partners uh, to to uh, connect people to testing sites where where they can get what they need. Dr. John Douglas. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I just wanted to agree with Bob in the uh, counties that we provide services to, Adams, Arapa, and Douglas counties. I did want to make one point that just as Kathy and uh, Drs. Price and Brumbaugh talked about the issue of staff sickness, uh, that has interrupted some of the capacity at the testing sites. Uh, so you, in some ways, our, our testing workforce is, is critical uh, as, as our inpatient workforce. And I think we do have some potential for seeing uh, irregularities evolve. I will also acknowledge what I think we're all aware of, that the rapid 
home test idea, which I think has a lot of promise. As Bob said, the administration is hoping to ramp that up. But really, at the present time, we're certainly finding in our counties uh, those rapid tests are really hard to come by. So uh, the, the fixed sites are working. The rapid home tests are more challenging. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Any other uh, comments? Teresa? I, yeah. Oh. I think we can expect uh, that we're going to continue to see uh, a difficulty getting the rapid tests. Um, they are in short supply nationwide, and I don't think we'll be getting any anytime soon. Um, that said, this is so predominant in the community. If you cannot get your hands on a rapid test and you feel symptoms of an illness or a cold, it's best to stay home, assume you have COVID for your five-day period. Very well said. Uh, Kathy, did I see you uh, come on? Uh... Yes, and I would just say as well, um, I have a testing site right outside my window so I can look at the line every day. Um, but throughout UC Health, we have increased um, our testing capacity. I think we're testing a little over 3,000 tests a day um, and still dealing with um, all of those issues related to staffing, et cetera. So we're testing as much as we can. And again, these are the PCR tests but there are long lines and there is a huge demand. Thank you all. Our Teresa? Mayor, let's go to Vinny. Vinny from Bloomberg. Thank you, Teresa. Hello, Mayor. Um, a, a couple of questions. I wanna verify the positivity rate, 25%, one in four. Secondly, add how many ICU beds are in the city and how many are full? And third, hope this list is not too long. Third, schools, are you planning to keep them open? Is there a chance they may go back to remote learning? Thank you very much. Bob McDonald? Yeah, thank you. I think I have three questions there. Yeah, the positivity rate uh, certainly fluctuates, but I, I think that's pretty accurate. It's in the uh, low to mid 20s. Uh, so that gives you a sense of just how widespread transmission is throughout our community. Um, uh, ICU capacity, and I'll, I'll turn it over to our healthcare partners here, but I was talking with a colleague of uh, Dr. Connie Price's over at uh, DHHA, uh, who told me yesterday, another physician over at the hospital, told me that in the last couple of days, he had seen where they had in one day uh, 14 or so COVID patients, and by the end of that same day, they had over 60. So, when you talk about ICU bed available, surg surgical beds available, that, that can change on a dime. Um, and I can tell you that uh, of the half a dozen or so healthcare hospitals uh, in the city of Denver, uh, many have uh, reported that they're at capacity um, and again, fluctuates very quickly. Um, with respect to schools, um, you know, I think uh, Dr. Brumbra said it very, very well earlier. It is so important to keep kids going to school um, we're going to do everything we can to not disrupt uh, any of the schools with that, um, with the, the, their curriculum and the learning process. Face coverings and vaccines do that. That's what keeps kids going to school. So we don't have any, um, uh, we're not discussing any additional uh, restrictions on schools and certainly not school closures. We work very closely with the school systems throughout the region, all our regional public health partners. We all are talking with our superintendents providing guidance. I don't know if anybody, any of our healthcare providers want to weigh in on the ICU. Yeah. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Bob. We do have Jason Valing, Director, Public Health Director of Jason Valing. Yeah, thanks Mayor Hancock and, and Bob. Uh, an additional point I wanted to bring in from both the Broomfield and Boulder perspective is we just had the devastating fire and the impact on the hospital system with the Vista Health being closed uh, for the foreseeable future the next couple of weeks. Uh, myself and my counterpart are from Boulder County Public Health in constant contact with both the state and with the CEOs from those hospital systems. But I think we should take that into consideration when we're talking about hospital capacity. And again, the need for all of us to step, take up, take those preventative measures of masking, testing, um, and getting vaccinated most importantly. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Price. Yeah, hi, I wanted to address the ICU capacity issue. If there's one saving grace with Omicron is it seems to be taking up less of the ICU, but 
uh, more of our acute care beds. So our census of COVID positive patients has never been higher. This is the highest we've been at any point in this pandemic. However, it does seem that they're requiring fewer ICU beds. So at our place right now, if you want a bed, what we have available is an ICU bed. We just don't have other beds available. Thank you, Dr. Brumbaugh. And then we'll go to Kathy Howe. Well, I, I just appreciate and want to second the uh, prioritization of keeping uh, schools open uh, throughout uh, this surge of the Omicron variant. Uh, a couple points that are really important. Uh, by and large, Omicron causes mild disease in children um, and not severe disease. Um, in contrast, when kids are kept out of school, we've seen the impacts of acute behavioral health crises and suicidal ideation in our kids uh, to the tune of in late uh, 2021, we were seeing 20 between 25 and 40 children per day who were coming to our emergency departments with acute behavioral health crises. So uh, that, the biggest antidote to that is keeping kids in school and keeping them in their normal routines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brumbaum. Kathy? My final, final comment regarding hospital capacity, definitely here at the University of Colorado today, our ICUs are about 98% full and our acute care beds um, are over 100%. Um, and the challenge is a lot of times patients, the COVID patients will come in to acute care and in about five days flip to ICU. So we're gonna watch this really closely to look at this trajectory, but it is high within our system. I think we had 335 patients this morning at 6 a.m. of COVID patients. We've seen a sharp uptick in the last couple days. And if we stay at this trajectory, we also will have record um, numbers of inpatients. So again, highly concerning time. Very good. I thought I saw Dr. Comstock. Uh, do you wanna make a final comment on this? Uh, yes, sir. Going back to schools, I, I really appreciate Bob McDonald's um, earlier statement about please give businesses a break. They're following mandates. The schools are as well. So please give schools a break. We've we've heard from Dr. Bramba how incredibly important it is to keep schools open and keep kids in class. In Jefferson County, we've worked with JPS to have them prepare. Given Omicron, it is very likely that schools may have to close because of staff shortages, because of high rates of illness. So please, parents, you know, work with the schools. Don't give the schools a hard time. Follow the mask orders. Follow all the other requests that schools make of you so we can all work together and do our part so we can keep schools open for in-person learning. Thank you, Dr. Comstock. Let's go uh, back to you, Teresa. All right, thanks, Mayor. Let's go to Alex Rose from Fox 31. Alex, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you so much for uh, holding this briefing. I'm just, because ICU capacity and acute care bed capacity is uh, such a pressing issue for hospitals, I want to get a better idea of, aside from COVID, uh, what is the driving factors behind the shortages of beds? We know that nurses quitting from burnout or getting sick or going for travel jobs and delayed care or some of these factors. But I just, since we have so many healthcare providers on the line, what's the other driving factors for these shortages? Thank you. Okay. Let's let's uh, go to uh, who would like to start. Dr. Price, you're up. Sure. Well, you know, throughout this pandemic, we've had to do, uh, make another a number of interventions to accommodate the acute surges and in, in our emergency departments including deferring uh, elective or non-emergent surgeries uh, and sometimes just deferring uh, basic medical care to accommodate the uh, surge in COVID that we've had recently and I think we're still trying to recover from that so you're seeing a lot more acuity in illnesses so people are staying longer and they're coming in with more severe illness that maybe could have gotten taken care of in an earlier time uh, had we not had uh, these challenges. Um, and then compounded with the staff shortages. We've seen shortages across the US in all Ooh. kinds of industries, but healthcare has been disproportionately uh, impacted. And then, you know, with the duration of the pandemic, this has been uh, a completely um, exhausting uh, challenge for many healthcare workers who have chosen other fields. Dr. Price, and I, I obviously we want to hear from Dr. Brumbaugh and Kathy Howell on this, but don't you think one of the other options is people second guess themselves whether or not they should go to a hospital for something that's not maybe COVID related, 
um, whether it, it could be the flu, it could be uh, a broken limb. They, they hesitate because of what they're hearing every day in the media in terms of the pressure, the stress on hospital systems and just the fear of walking in where there are COVID positive people sitting waiting to be served. Doesn't that present as serious a threat to the public overall public health? As oh, it does. Else? It, it absolutely does. We, we don't want that message to come through. And that's why we've stood up other modalities to get care. And if you're not sure, you can call the, our nurse line. You can use telemedicine modalities. And if you need to be seen in person, we need to get you in to be seen in person. Um, but, you know, it's a balance. And uh, but that is the reality of the challenge we face. Yeah, I asked that question because I'm aware of an elderly patient who waited two days with a broken arm before going to the hospital. And that's just the kind of stuff. And I think about people with chest pains and other potentially deadly um, situations uh, waiting. Let's go to Dr. Brumbaugh and Kathy Howe. You wanna add anything additional to this point? I'll just make one point. The, the, the drivers of our capacity challenges over the last four months have been the changes in the epidemiology of virus circulation in kids that have occurred as a result of the pandemic. So. Respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, is the main driver of respiratory hospitalization in children. And typically that season of RSV, if you will, occurs in the winter months, December through about March. Uh, for the first time in, in, in human history, as far as we know, RSV uh, hit North America in late July, August. Um, and so we saw a late summer and fall surge of these respiratory illnesses that have really caused the capacity crunch at our hospitals. At the same time, we've seen a spike in behavioral health patients, as I mentioned earlier. Very, yeah, well said. And Patty? my last comment is probably the other piece of um, that the number of hospitalizations is not related to surgeries. It pains us to understand how many surgeries we are putting off. And these aren't elective, so there's hardly any surgery that's elective. Um, but these are patients with cancer diagnoses, mm -hmm. et cetera, that really need their surgery done. Now, they're not going to die today if we don't do their surgery. They're not emergent. But boy, if that was you and you had a cancer diagnosis, you'd want your surgery done as soon as you can. So it's it's very painful. They're, it's creating a lot of moral distress for our healthcare workers. But boy, we, we have such empathy for our patients who are delayed because we are really having to um, curb all of our ORs just to allow space for all of the other patients that are coming through the emergency department. Okay, let's go, Teresa. Any other questions? My battery. Uh, low. Katie, I did not get to Katie from Channel Nine. Katie, did you have a question? Are there any other journalists on the line who um, might have joined a little late who I missed? I don't think well, so, Mayor. I think we're, we're yes. good. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you to the panel and to the media, members of the media who've joined us today. This is an important issue. Again, broken record, get vaccinated, get the booster if you haven't done so and you're eligible to do so. This is the best way for us to deal with what we're dealing with right now and to get on the other side of this. So thank you. We'll try to get you guys an update uh, sooner than later going down the road.